everyone. I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk Virtual Edition. Yes, I'm in my home in Rancho Palos Verdes, sheltering in place and now being joined by our mayor who's in his office, RPV Mayor John Cruikshank. Thanks again for being here. I know you're at work in your office, safe distancing, of course. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you, Liz. Well, thank you for doing this. Of course, we want you to help us update our community right now. We're weeks in to uh, all being at home and everybody wants to hear from you, our mayor, just how are we faring here in RPV and just um, your overall message right now to our community. Uh, sure. Well, thank you uh, for asking about how I'm doing and I, I've been, I'm fine. And really our focus now is how our communities are doing and I know that people are struggling to, to get back to businesses, what we remember as usual. And I'm actually working very closely with our city staff to figure out how we can phase and start to open up our city back again. We all know that currently the reopened order from the county is on the 15th of May, which is, as of this airing, roughly three weeks away. Uh, which seems like an eternity, but it, it'll come upon us quickly and couldn't come any sooner. But uh, we want to make sure we strategize. But the reality is that life is full of risks and we need to find a balance between safety and getting back to, to doing what we do. So in terms of the latest news coming out of City Hall, I don't know what you can share regarding like COVID-19 situation, sort of the case count, anything that you can today update us on? Well, as, as the community probably knows, our city staff has been updating every day what's going on with COVID-19. I think I just read that the current case count in, in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes is 50 individuals. It seems to just kind of be trickling in at this point, so which is a great, which is great news that it seems that things are not spiking at this point, and they never really have spiked uh, in our city, but you know, one case is too many, of course. So we're developing plans to start reopening our facilities, and the city will probably start to see things slowly open. They'll put a smile on their face when mm -hmm. they see some barriers get moved away. Of course, uh, we will not be doing much advertising because we really want it for our residents to, to enjoy. And so please be looking for that. I don't have any immediate announcements that I want to say right now, but I'm right. sure people will figure it out as it happens. The other thing is that uh, one thing I've been trying to do is coordinate with the other beach cities. Uh, we all know the county beaches, which are all the South Bay beaches, are closed. And we, we realize that we really can't be reopening our major uh, facilities like Del Cerro or even uh, Abalone Cove uh, or Point Vicente until those uh, locations and the beaches are open because we don't want to take the brunt of people trying to get a little sunshine. Um, even though we'd love to do that, we, we can't do that to our residents. Well, it's a, this is April 23rd, the day we're reporting it. Every day the information keeps changing. Of course, this week is supposed to be beautiful, so it's going to be so tempting. We've got this beautiful ocean. Everybody wants to be out and about. But as far as the rules in place as of today, like what do residents, there's confusion, like do in RPV, do we need to have a mask on when we're in public or is it just more, when we're in an essential business? So can you just kind of, once again, even though we should know this by now, just what is sort of the protocols in our city in terms of what you need to do and to be COVID-19 safe? Right. A lot of our businesses are still uh, closed because of the county and state order of what they consider essential businesses. And I think everyone knows what that means at this point. You know, you see a lot of people that are out and about uh, jogging, uh, riding their bikes, um, walking and exercising. And so, um, you know, it's very difficult to jog or ride a bike with a mask on. And I think the counties realize that. So they're, they're allowing people to uh, go out outside without the mask. Uh, it's only when you get in contact or close in, in the essential businesses where you're in contact with people, you really need to still be wearing a mask and keeping a safe distance. You know, as we reopen our trails and that and, and people start to, to go to places where there's other parts of the public, you know, I think we've had it beat into our heads pretty good what, what's safe and what's not safe at this point. And clearly, uh, our, our residents have been very patient in terms of what's been closed. They get it. So with that regard, and, you know, we, we've, we've been very pleasantly surprised on how, how wonderful people have been. Um, it's really our businesses now that are the ones that we need to figure out how to help them get their back on their feet. I just heard today uh, that one out of six Americans lost their jobs during this, which, I mean, that, those numbers are unbelievably bad. Um, and so, um, 
Our city realizes that our local businesses are struggling during our April 7th meeting. We actually, uh, in our small way, we did a couple things. Number one, any small business uh, in our uh, city that's one and a half million or less, they can reapply to get their business license repaid to them for this year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first thing. So you can go to our city website and, and have uh, apply for that. The other thing is, is that we, we get uh, monies from, uh, from the state for uh, uh, community development block grant money. And typically that money is used to uh, uh, create safe uh, paths to schools or for people with disabilities, such as curb ramps and that to be built. We've decided this year that that money is avail can be available for loans for those small businesses as well. So if some of the small businesses in our, in our city want to apply for that, you could go to our website and, and, and do that and hopefully help them out a little bit. And on the subject of, of business, how is RPV, the city, as city halls close, able to conduct business with the residents right now? Like how is that whole operation happening? You know, back around March 13th, everyone knows that City Hall has been closed to the public. Although during that time and since that time, we've continued to, to work, the city staffs continue to work, and they've made sure that the essential services are being uh, taken care of for our residents. Um, some of the staff members in our city are reporting to work and some are still working from home. And so, and there's a rotation period in terms of who's coming in. So our city staff is currently doing all the things that they had done before. They're just doing it in, a, in, in that safer at home uh, environment. Um, also, uh, the call, any calls that are coming in or emails are being responded to is pretty much as quick as they've always been. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, but most of the activities are being done electronically, which is, at the end of the day, it's going to be great because I think a lot of the way our city staff processes and does work during this time, these troubling times, they'll be able to use that to have quicker and better services once all this done. Uh, for construction activities, you probably see that projects are still happening in our city. Uh, even though it has slowed down, we are, the city is accepting, reviewing, and issuing building permits. And the building inspectors are, uh, some of the building inspections are, it says here, occurring as virtual inspections. I, I haven't actually witnessed that, but I guess that's working out as well. I know, and because of this virtual world we're living in, I do look forward to being back in our RPV TV studio together to do these interviews, but this is the reality right now. Um, but because of the demands to do business virtually, whether for you as mayor, you're doing all kinds of meetings now, city council meetings are virtual. Um, this was an agenda item at your last council meeting um, that just took place this week um, about addressing enhancing technology now um, to better serve the community, especially to have participation when you have council meetings. So talk about what this, how the city and staff are, are shifting to work with this. Sure. Um, you're correct that the last city council meeting, we actually did start to discuss the use of technology so we could have more public participation. This was an item that we started to discuss prior to this whole COVID-19 uh, uh, epidem epidemic. Um, so um, one of the ideas is because about a quarter of our residents are actually senior citizens and, and not just that, but a lot, our residents are busy people. Um, and getting to driving to City Hall to, to say three minutes worth of discussion um, when you're working in Pasadena or in Orange County uh, really becomes difficult for people so they can't always participate. So something that our staff is looking at is to, uh, even though we're conducting our meetings virtually, we're actually allowing people to uh, participate virtually as well, uh, which includes things such as uh, submitting a audio recording or a video comment, and then that being played to the city council during the meeting during that item. Also, we were looking at um, a simpler mechanism for people to participate, and what uh, they've added or suggested solution is called Just Ask link, which is on our city uh, website, and basically, uh, Residents can go there and submit questions and uh, participate uh, virtually. Right. So the main thing, too, for residents listening and anyone, just go on the city website, rpvca.gov. I mean, there's so much great information about how to work, navigate this COVID-19 world. In our, and also, though, if you want to participate, you can click on the meeting and then you will be put into the system and then you'll get the link so that you can participate. 
And, and, and on that note, like the, as mayor, I mean, you're kind of conducting a lot of meetings virtually with regionally, right? I know that you still have your obligations as mayor in like, terms of communicating with all the other cities right now and coordinating. Tell a little bit more about how that's going and with like just sort of like working as a community um, in terms of sharing resources and things like that. Sure. Well, uh, let me first talk about our city manager and his staff. Okay. Um, Laura uh, Marani, and he's been uh, actively involved in what he calls the Area G Emergency Operations Planning Efforts. And they, we are one of 13 cities that participate in this Alert South Bay. So that's kind of that regional approach where uh, they're sharing information and sharing good ideas so that, that we're all coordinated in terms of what's going on. Um, also, our city officials have daily communications uh, with the neighboring peninsula cities, so the three other cities on the hill. I know our city manager every day is talking to them and he uses that information to actually update our website, which you'll find at the website that you just gave. Um, and that's where we get the daily updates. Uh, we also, with the four, the four peninsula cities, they developed a resource guide for seniors and individuals with disabilities. And that's also available on our city's website. Um, as mayor, as you just mentioned, I've been involved with a lot of virtual meetings um, and, and uh, with the other South Bay cities and with the ma other mayors in the, on the peninsula. In fact, we uh, still are doing a, uh, every other week we're doing a mayor's meeting, uh, including the president of the school board and the president of the Peninsula Library Board. And we're hearing what's going on with them we're able to share ideas and resources with them. Um, so I think what really is happening is we're building a tremendous bond virtually, of mm -hmm. course, with, with all these other uh, leaders and, and other cities and organizations. And so, and, and other meetings such as the South Bay Cities Council of Government uh, are still ongoing. We're still meeting virtually. So the things for the people's business has not stopped just because of this pandemic. And so we continue to work. And even last week, I had the opportunity to participate in a virtual Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce uh, a virtual town hall, and uh, along with the city of Rolling Hills Estates. And so we we're able to tell uh, the businesses, the business community, what, what's going on with our city. Um, and finally, uh, regional law and peninsula emergency preparedness committees are both scheduled to meet in May. Okay. Um, you know, we hear as we watch news all day long and it can, can be kind of depressing you know, <laughs> with what's happening more than that as everyone's lifestyles have been turned upside down. But we always want to re keep reminding our, about thanking our first responders, the frontline workers, the people that are working, people in our own city staff that are putting themselves out there to help you know, our businesses and help the community still keep going. Um, what are you hearing about the first responders, like the sheriffs and our fire, how they're being impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic? Anything you're hearing um, from the, from, you know, the, our captain from Lomita Sheriffs that you can share with the community right now? Sure. Um, well, as of this point, actually crime is down. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, you know, thank goodness. Uh, you know, we, we've kind of heard that the natives are getting a little restless and, and, and we understand that. I mean, we're all getting a little stir crazy being in our homes, but the sheriff's department, they're continuing to provide and the fire department, they're continuing to provide outstanding service. Um, like I said, even though the, the crime rates have inherently dropped, um, which is a silver lining to all this, our sheriffs and fire have committed to to increase their patrols of our streets and make sure that our concerns of our residents and local businesses are all being met. Um, just a little positive silver lining today, uh, the city manager, Ara Moranian and I, we, uh, we use city funds, a little bit of city funds to go over to a local business, the Subway Sandwich Shop and Golden Cove. We bought uh, uh, some lunches uh, and drove them over to some of the lab workers over at Harbor UCLA, and they were super excited. I, when we got there with the lunches, I could see them waiting uh, with their carts, and you could tell they were waiting for, they didn't know what, who we, what we looked like or anything, but I rolled my window down and yelled, who's hungry? And they all yelled, yes, we are. So it's just fun, and you know, seeing them, they're in good spirits over at the hospitals, and we want to continue to do that for our local hospitals. We, we have a lot of respect and appreciation for uh, those that are keeping us healthy and safe. And, and so we just want to say thank you to them. 
That was tremendous that you did that, that act of kindness from the city, but also again, supporting our local businesses here, which on that note, we must remind everyone that, what are we calling it? Takeout Tuesdays and Thursdays? Yes. Make sure that there's a lot of uh, restaurants in our community that are, are open for takeout. And uh, you can go on our city website also to find that list. That was very nice. And I, but you didn't get to stick around and eat with these folks, I take it. It was a drop off with masks on probably. And uh, yeah, you know, you know, it's funny. And yeah, we had our masks and, and of course, gloves. And uh, the, I asked the city to set me up with some gloves and they gave me these bright orange gloves. So uh, having worked at Caltrans, it brought back good memories of wearing orange. Oh. Uh, but it, it was fun. And no, we, we didn't, neither Ara and I uh, stayed with them with our lunches. We gave them lunches and then we went back to our offices to eat our sack lunches that we we made for ourselves this morning. So I want to appreciate all your effort that you're doing. Um, I'm going to shift gears and talk about the fact that, you know, the city has lots of business they're attending to still, including its budget season. And um, with all the economic uncertainty and the financial hardship, um, even more challenging for council and staff to come up with the 2021 budget. Um, we already know the impact it's having with just having Terranea closed. Um, but before we get into all navigating the budget season, I want to rec mention that our city manager has um, hired a uh, new finance director. She's not new because she was promoted. She's been with the city, Trong Nguyen. And so I want to just share a little bit about her before we get in because she's now leading the, um, leading the city to deal with the financial situation. She, she is. And, and uh, you know, Trang's been with the city for I, at least five years or so. Uh, and she's always been a joy to work with. And so we're very excited for her being our new uh, finance director. Um, you know, just like uh, we talked about at the last uh, 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 time we did our interview that, you know, Ara being a fairly new city manager and all the things he's dealing with, you know, the, this is probably one of the most, could be one of the most difficult times in our city's uh, history in terms of finances. But you know, I always tell people this, uh, when I ran for council and when I won, I finally said, I just don't want to screw things up. And I, I really, you know, before I give you a little bit of background on track, I just want to say thank you to all the people that have led the city and have worked for the city before me, because we're really fortunate. We actually have a reserve and something we're going to try to preserve as best we can. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's so, so much financial thought that went into our city's budgets prior to me even being on the council. And so I just want to say kind of thank you to all the, the people that have been involved with that. Um, so Ara gave me a few notes on, on Trang because I didn't know some of these things. Obviously, she is very knowledgeable financer or she wouldn't have that job. But uh, she also uh, spearheaded the implementation of our current city's financial system. And she's developed all these new financial reports, such as the checkbook function and open gov on the city's website. So she really knows how our finances work. And, um, you know, when Aro was going through the process of interviewing, I, th I think he realized that, that, you know, just her positive spirit really is something mm -hmm. that appealed to him. Um, you know, knowing numbers is one thing, but also understanding the goals of our city and understanding how our city works really, really makes, is going to make a difference for us. So we're really excited for Trang. On the flip side of the positive news of hiring her, uh, like you mentioned, the, the city's financial situation is not pretty. Uh, we, we did an initial uh, kind of a budget workshop a week and a half ago. And unfortunately, our, right now with Terranea closed and with all the other businesses closed and sales tax not coming in, we're, we're currently losing more than 600000 a month. And, um, you know, we, we do have reserves, but, but our city staff has been working very hard to, to um, come up with ways to minimize the amount of impact to our city. Uh, but this is a huge hit to our city right now. And, and so... You know, we've got our work ahead of us in the next few months to make sure that our budget is is going to be solvent. Right. So, you know, pre-COVID-19, our financial situation looked really good. I mean, we always had really hefty reserves and we're, you know, so, well, hopefully things will turn around quickly. The process itself, I know you've already had the one work, budget workshop. There's one on Monday, April 27th. And for the community they can also then go and um, go onto the city website if they want to view and watch it, but there, it is virtual and, but they don't get recorded and put on our PV TV or anything like that. So you have to make sure if you want to be involved, you have to log in, I believe. Is that right? 
That's right. Right. So yeah. during that process, though, give us a little scene setter of what you want to see happen. As you know, the, the process begins in January and right. then we conclude in June. And then July 1 is our, our start of our fiscal year. Um, and, you know, typically in a, in a typical year, you know, there wouldn't be a lot of changes in terms of our budget. You know, there might be more revenues coming in just because the value of our properties go up. And so the amount of property taxes go up. And so and, and with that, the expenses go up slightly with it. But for the most part, uh, we're remaining uh, with our, our reserves and all the different formulas that we use to make sure that we keep a solid amount of money uh, to protect our city assets. Um, but because of this COVID-19, actually the city halted all of its typical work and started reassessing, you know, what, what's going on for the projections. And, you know, obviously the projections are not pretty and, and they're not going to just start ramping up and be 100% uh, immediately. We all know that it's going to take time for this thing to, to get back to where we even were before this. And the way the projections look is we're probably looking at the end of next year by the time we start getting over all these losses that we've had. Um, so setting aside the 50% city uh, reserve policy, uh, we still have an excess reserve of almost 5.6 million. So there's some good news and going back to the, you know, the forethought of the people that set these budgets up before they, they weren't dummies. They, they knew that, these sort of scenarios can happen. And so, um, you know, we, we in our city are very fortunate to have that. Um, but regardless of that, um, our council is pretty well, that we don't want to be dipping into our reserves. Right. Um, and so, you know, we, and right now we need to find just for this year about 700,000 in savings. Uh, and then next year it'll be well over a couple million dollars in savings. Um, and that's because our city staff's already gone through department by department and figured out how they can reduce their expenses. And so we've been pretty proactive in this uh, uh, process over the last couple months. And so the council does need to find um, some savings. But here's the thing. I mean, we, we, so we have a great finance advisory committee. Uh, they've agreed with these assumptions that we talked about in terms of lost revenues. And then we also have a great infrastructure management advisory committee. And that's a group of people that are, are residents that all have different professional backgrounds. And they're helping us in working with our city staff to prioritize our capital improvement projects because that's the biggest portion of our, our budget. Um, of course, uh, sheriffs is a big part too, but we're not gonna be reducing that, um, but we, do have an opportunity to look at our capital improvements. And so we're gonna be taking the recommendations of our IMAC committee and, and, and really making some tough decisions. Um, kind of moving forward, just to end up the conversation of the budget, obviously with businesses like Terranea that we so depend on, you know, in, in all of our big businesses like that, that are closed, um, hopefully, you know, things will normalize sooner than later and we'll see those money back, that money back in our coffers, you know? So. I mean, that, that's the goal is to get people back to work. I, I say this over and over that every, every job is essential, mm -hmm. um, regardless of what government people say. Everyone that goes to work and tries to put food on the table for themselves and their family is essential. Right. Um, moving back to council meetings, because you're still meeting twice a month virtually, yep. um, some of the agenda items that you just re recently dealt with and actually um, the PFAL management program. Uh, that's been going on since 2015 and I had I got to go out with our um, the wildlife gentleman that was doing the trapping and see how it was all done but the, the council decided to pause this um, PFAL trapping program at least for the next year it will save the city some money but that wasn't really the reason behind it it's is it still necessary right now so just talk about the council decision and and what's going on with the history of the PFAL management plan and and why put it on pause you bet um well, two of the most passionate issues in our city are coyotes and the peacocks. And I've known that from the very beginning. Uh, our job as council members is to listen to the community. Um, this is the first time I got every single one of our late correspondence, and we had 59 pages of late correspondence. Every single one was on that item. All the other items had no comments. So. Um, 
we read each one, we go through and think about each one. Um, and so public comment is hugely important. Uh, and, and just so that people know on both sides of the issue, we get comments from both sides. It's not just one side or the other. Uh, but I think that because the numbers are certainly down, it looks like PFAL in 2014, we had 278 and now we only have 121. Um, and also given the current circumstances of, of you know, dealing with so many other things, that it just seemed like it was time to take a break from it this year. So we're going to suspend trapping for this year. Uh, we're going to continue to do the census in the spring to see how many are there. And hopefully the population levels uh, rise up uh, here in the spring. Uh, we had lots of wet weather and lots of things for the birds to eat. Uh, so we probably will see that and then we'll take the census again. Me, I, I live on the border of Rolling Hills and, and Rancho Palos Verdes and uh, during the spring, there's always one or two hens out there uh, making their noise, and I love the noise. I, it doesn't bother me, but I also get the people that, you know, get their roofs torn up and get all the rest of their flowers eaten, you know. I know during the meeting, um, uh, Council Member Bradley said, well, how can we strike a balance so that they're really, they're not a nuisance, um, but yet people that love the beauty, and there's, they're really in a strain, I and mean, unfortunately, I don't feel like either you love these birds or you don't. Yeah, and just so people know, we, we don't trap and kill the birds. We actually right. trap and relocate them to places where they can handle more birds. Right. So. And I think one thing was interesting just to learn about and be educated on the, how this, this population works is that without probably trapping, you'll probably see every year a 30% increase in the birds. Yeah. Something along those they, lines. They, they don't slow down in that regard. Okay. So um, moving on, because we've got to wrap it up. You, um, as mayor, have done an excellent job in trying to honor and recognize, you know, residents in our community that um, are inspirational. Um, as and and one of them you just honored at the last meeting was Linda Reed, who's a school board member, um, for what she's doing—a phenomenal job with reaching out to seniors to help right now with this COVID nineteen situation, with setting up a grocery shopping system. So talk about Linda and your choice to like, you know, recognize her. And, and just how she's making such a difference. Yeah, uh, so Linda is one of our school board members. And when you define leader, she's right in that definition. Um, and the reason I say that is because she recognized that uh, there was a need to match seniors that maybe needed someone to go do shopping with uh, students that are now at home um, and not going to attending school. So those students and, and maybe uh, recent graduates and other people that want to volunteer that have vehicles that can get in their car and go buy stuff for our seniors and try to match up that and some of the chores. So she's getting volunteers matched up with our seniors and uh, doing uh, an amazing job of that. that that's what community is all about. And, you know, giving uh, Linda and all the volunteers recognition is, it was, is really important to our city. All right, so Mr. Mayor, as we start to wrap things up, I just wanna say you are incredibly inspirational right now to me and the community. All you're doing leading, the, leading us through this, um, these times. And uh, I wonder what inspires you right now? Well, um, first of all, it's an incredible honor to be the mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, I never forget that. Um, and even during these difficult times, what, what inspires me is that even though one in six Americans currently have lost their jobs and, and people are generally hurting, I know that those around us want to help one another. And I think it's incumbent upon us as leaders to not only shut things down quickly for safety, but also figure out how we can better balance business and, and the community and safety and get out of this as quick as we can. Uh, so my hope is, is that my message as a business owner and as a family person that we can, can work together to, to figure all this out and get out of this mess. Right. So thank you. I do know you're going to be attending a lot more virtual council meetings coming up. We'll be staying tuned and reminding the community, log on to rpvca.gov um, to really keep up with all the, what's happening in our community. And there's lots of help there to help you kind of navigate. And again, thank you, Mayor John Cruikshank, for joining us here on City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Be healthy and safe out there. Have a great day. <music>